Bill, as you know, as we learn in the film, uh, this this uh, this movie, this 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 uh, uh, film that was found, it's not a rare. There's not rare footage. It is uh, a popular film that is readily available. Did that change at all the way you worked on the on the piece mm. or not? Uh, no, I, I came to the project already knowing that. Um, so the timeline was that Johan uh, wrote me, and um, and then I wrote the archive. And by then they'd already put some frames out on um, Facebook, and an ex Russian expat living in Iceland quickly identified that as a, a very popular film that everyone grew up with in Russia. Um, but it does beg the question, it's, it wasn't rare for a Russian person, but it's rare for us, right? I mean, we haven't heard of that film, we haven't heard of any of these films, you know, the, uh, maybe Ivan the Terrible or a couple more if you're a Russian film scholar, but that long credit sequence mm -hmm. at the end, um, I think speaks to that. It's that um, there's ways for films to be lost to us um, besides being found in the bottom of the ocean. And and, and I think going to that to that list that you mentioned, I mean, it's amazing. I was you know just just, just a quick scroll, but you can see there's some of the major uh, names of uh, Russian cinema: is yeah. and Konishev and Traver and Boris awesome. Barnett. Um, and so so the, the the span of this career is really really interesting. When uh, well, th so that that was what was compelling to me. Like, uh, once I learned what the title of this film was, I went to IMDb and learned that this guy was, um, he had this career that spanned from 1915 to 1981, which was more or less the, the length of time of the Soviet Union. You know, he predated it by a few years and he checked out a few years early, but maybe four or five years difference between these two, uh, this lifespan and the span of this um, party. So uh, he was in a way a unique way to explore the Russian 20th century um, and the way that his roles on film became artifacts of, of that. So y you, you decide that you, you fo focus on him pretty much from the very, from the very beginning. Yeah, that that seemed like the way I could go through it. I mean, I uh, was already fascinated by the story. I thought that uh, it was something of a miracle that uh, four rolls of film were recovered from not just the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, but the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, like the, the very center. Um, and that by virtue of being at the center, they were preserved by, you know, the the gases and that came out of the the crease, and uh, and that that were they were somehow in a a new found themselves um, on a neutral island somewhere between the east and the west, and so there was all these convergences of uh, coincidence that um, and then you know that the Johan as a Icelandic person reached over to me as a Westerner, um, you know. There was some way that the film was calling out to me that seems sort of, um, I don't know, uh, well, it, it was compelling to me. And, um, and I thought that a way of exploring it instead of arriving at this, which I guess could have been, um, you know, the, the big reveal at the end, um, if I had started with um, Jaroff's young man and uh, and then said and then he got to be you know th at this age in the 1969 and uh, his film was found in the bottom of the ocean that could have been like a, a different way of telling the story but it wasn't the honest way of telling the story the r way that i came into the story was because it was found on the bottom of the ocean and that's what i wanted to explore is what happens to a specific print um that is cast from a master negative and that master negative may still exist but all these prints have different lives out in the world um, as do all of us and i, I hadn't had an, a chance to see this on a big screen but the the the, uh, the the damage effect on the on the emulsion is so uh beautiful 
and uh, it it just it just is just different from other from it's any a, other one. Yeah, absolutely different experience, and I didn't get to really see it large until I mixed it. You know, but it's um, you know it really allows you to get into different parts of the screen and watch things that are, you know, for instance, to not watch the subtitles if you don't want to. You know. And 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 uh, it, uh, do you think that Tarov was so fascinated by this this character just because of the success of the film, or there was something about the detective that he liked? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, throughout his career, he played an outsider, um, and it's sometimes to comic effect, um, as you saw in a bunch of these roles. Um, but he was always somebody who was slightly behind the times and, and, that, and played that, um, you know, uh, against what w expectations were. So you saw him saying, you know, um, uh, for instance, he, when he's, um, he's not a, always a good socialist, right? He's, he's maybe hitting on this girl or he's like uh, a gambler or, you know, he's using... Uh, his party affiliations um, to get ahead, or you know, um, and and he's he's held up as an example of how not to be. Um, by the time he gets to be an older guy, and he's playing the district police officer in this small town where there hasn't been a crime since 1948, it's kind of a joke, you know. He's he's uh, and he's he's mocked as the old uncle in town. Um, he's kind of clinging to um, the old status quo of the communist party whereas now it's 1969 and all the young people are looking at you know the revolutions of 1968 for their um the way out of this how you know how to act and how to behave and and he's trying to kind of pull them back into a more traditional and conservative um lifestyle so um i think he liked that uh, irony um because it was at once championing um, the Soviet Union, but also with a double-edged thing that, um, as any older person would think, that, look, the young people are, are kind of uh, going off the rails. And um, so that this film was released theatrically. What we're seeing here was a 4.3 reduction print that was probably used either for a cruise ship or uh, for television. Um, he made two more uh, sequels to it um, uh, where he plays the Aniskin character and, um, and he directed both of those for television. So um, I think it became, this was very popular and it was sort of a good resting place for him. I, I think he played Falstaff uh, after that, which was kind of a, a, a role that would be made for him, you know. Um, but... Uh, uh, those were, you know, he he kind of he had a series going, and it was a good way for him to go out. You know. Raise your hand if you uh, if you have any questions. Oh, there's one. So many questions. But I want to ask you one thing that Julia mentioned about where did you sit in terms of preservation, which I thought we were talking about. Sure. If you talk about the beauty of what I saw as water damage and all those things. When you showed us. Oh yeah, Short. her her violet kiss. Violet kiss. Right. Yeah. Now, was all this water damage different to both of these, or were these effects that you added? I think. Oh, I n I don't add effects. I'm much too lazy for that. You know? <laughs> 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 That's what you thought. Right? But uh, uh, um, no, the, uh, they're two totally different stocks. So the um, the print that was found in the bottom of the ocean was actually diacetate. You know, um, we stopped making nitrate stock in the early 50s, um, 1950 or 51. Um, and uh, and this held up because the water was very cold and um, presumably also because of these uh, different uh, chemicals that were at the bottom of the m in the mud. Uh, whereas her violet kiss is from 1928 and it's from nitrate stock, so that was actively decomposing um, at the time I scanned it. Or lack of emotion. And here you have that with the fully protective and straight line score. But then you have two other things too. You have a Bob Soviet film sequence after. 
one thing he was doing was archival work. And I was showing him what brought you to that form, that niche form of sort of fiction. And I would also include the plot, you know, the plot of the original mm -hmm. um, film. So, um, yeah, it was a way of examining um, the different way these disparate elements had um, had all disintegrated in some way. And um, so uh, we as Westerners don't have access to those films. So um, they could be, they are in a sense at the bottom of some other ocean, you know. Um, and um, um, so there's things that separate us from our memory as a, a global people, you know. Um, and so I wanted to try to examine um, uh, what those things were. And, and some of it is, um, you know, the time that we live in a different time, and some of it's language, um, some of it's cultural, and the story doesn't wouldn't make sense to us anymore, and it doesn't make sense to contemporary Russians either. That it's sort of a throwback. And, um, and the way that time moves, and, um, and a piece of film can be a snapshot of the time that it was made, but over time, it changes, and um, in this way, the print is the manifestation of that. It, it's, it's the evidence of that, um, the visual evidence of time passing, um, not just the time that passed when it was shot, but the time that's passed since it was shot, and now the time that's passing as we're watching it. As a follow-up to this, as and to what what you mentioned before about the the the, the film being found found in it, sort of in, in the middle of in between, you know, the east and, and the west. How difficult was for you the, the, a, a further dimension to this film as your, your the fact that you I presume you don't you're not fluent in Russian, so there is all there is all that you know language yeah. and 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 entering this culture through through a language that you don't know and and this cinema. Yeah, I mean, that was really tough. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't really learn a lick of Russian the entire time. <laughs> um, but uh, I did have a great producer working with me, uh, Maria Vinogradova. And um, uh, she translated not just that film, but all the clips that I had you know, um, selected, which seemed to me to be interesting, and it seemed to me to be germane to my hypothesis. And, um, and I mean, one nice thing about um, the Russian culture is that they, it is a culture of piracy and almost all these clips are, exist in some form um, on YouTube and uh, so <laughs> I could find what I wanted uh, to include for the most part uh, and then go back to the archive and, um, and find the master. Um, so that Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of back and forth, and um, this was very much a COVID movie, so I, I, I got to wrestle with it without a lot else to do. Um, so uh, uh, with uh, David and I have worked on um, a number of projects together. I'm not sure how many, but around eight or nine. Um, most of them where I'm making a visual component for a live performance, um, or, or in some cases, a, a, for lack of a better word, a music video for his, for his um, pre-existing music. And in uh, one other case, I used his pre-existing music in a, a film of mine, but I'd never worked with him in such a way as, which is the common way a director and a film composer would work, where I have some sort of cut and I'm giving him cues. And uh, so th we worked that way um, uh, for the most part. I mean, he, he gave me... Um, well, let's say to back up, um, at one point we thought this could all be done as a choral piece because he's a great composer for choral music and one of our best. And um, uh, that was an exciting idea that this could be an oratorio and that the libretto could be sung um, and that that would also be, there would be a live component to that. Um, but it became increasingly impractical, especially as COVID set upon us. So like, how are we going to ever get a choir together or to sing or, you know, how would this, how does this work? And I said, you know, it is about a lost 
accordion you know we could just maybe you know an accordionist you know and he goes oh yeah there's this guy in Copenhagen he's the guy so um uh we you know David composed on MIDI scores uh and sent to me different clips and he just started sending a bunch of stuff and uh, eventually I could specify how long I wanted them to be but I also thought that they should be slower and lower uh so I took the first few ones he did and just slowed them down 33%. What do you mean lower? Well, by slowing it down, uh, oh, the okay. key becomes uh, oh, the key lower. lower. You know? So uh, he rewrote them as slower and lower. And then he said, I don't know if Frody can play this, um, but uh, we'll send it to him and see what he does. And so it, it created this accordion sound that I'd never heard before that sounded more like a pipe organ. Um, you had a question? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, originally uh, I thought Johan was going to write the score as he brought the project to me. Um, uh, the last time I saw him, um, we agreed that he would, though it took some um, cajoling because he had enormous number of projects hanging over his head. Um, and But I, I guess that would have been in the uh, late winter of uh, 2017 was the last time I saw him, and we had lunch together, and and he thought that um, that he could do it, um, but he suggested that it would be an entirely percussion score, and which I hadn't really considered. And I, I said, well, maybe maybe we'll get to you know the instrumentation later, you know. Um, but uh, David was an enormous hero of his, so it seemed fitting to ask David to to work on this once uh, Johann passed in 2018. Any other question? Oh, good to see you. Hi. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, there's. I've always been fascinated by that concept that um, film is actually a set of layers, and that there is a plate tectonic, or that you know that it is sedimentary in that way, in the same way that the Earth that we walk on is. And on the and so I was so grateful that there was a moment in this film where I had a chance to sort of. Uh, illustrate that you know to to um you know because um for instance i always think of the work of um, phil solomon that he would remove layers and um and and then reprint the frame with lighting that showed the actual um the actual to say it again the actual layers on of the of emulsion um, onto the base and so by showing that cross section and comparing that to the, uh, the earth mantle was something I always wanted to do, and there was a, an opportunity to do that here. Now we have, have a question. Have a question. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, what are your hopes for distribution on this? For well, I think they've been fulfilled. You know, oh. Kino, Kino Lorber is <laughs> distributing it. And, uh, and thank you for the uh, intro, but the Blu ray DVD is released tomorrow. Um, and, um, and it'll be streaming and um, you know, for a weird little film that's about as much I could ask for you know. <laughs> the other hand question yeah um, I have to ask you when you told us you went to the Russian archive by the time you went there did you have any concept when you first walked in what you were going to do or was that the first uh, so I guess the timeline let's see how this go um, 
so, you know, Johan wrote me in 2016 while I was finishing Dawson City, and I didn't have time to work on this project in 2016, but I kind of had an idea that, that would, this would be my next project, even though I kind of said everything I wanted to say about archival film by then. Um, this just seemed like a gift, and I, w I would pursue it, and like, no, just to see where it went. So I think what happened was in July 2017, um, I was going to show Dawson City in Bologna at Cinema Retrovato, and um, and I, there was a, I had the middle seat and the aisle seat was next to me on the plane, and Dave Kerr from MoMA um, took that seat. And um, was here until until this morning. <laughs> doesn't surprise me. And uh, at any rate, um, uh, we st he said, "What are you working on next?" And I said, "Well, there's this, you know." Maybe you heard about it, but there was these films found at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm interested in pursuing this uh, Russian actor. And he's like, well, when you're in Bologna, you want to talk to Peter, you know, Peter ba Bagrov. And so um, uh, when I got to Bologna, um, I had coffee with Peter, and Peter could just extemporaneously dash off, I don't know, a couple dozen titles that Zharov was in and uh, what they're significant. And he also speaks better English than I do. And so I was like, well, this is the guy I need to talk to. So um, as fate would have it, um, uh, Dawson City was also being booked at uh, uh, the garage in, in Moscow in, uh, in October, uh, which was, by the way, the centennial of the revolution. You know, it was October 2017. Um, and so um, I believe we went to Iceland in September and uh, met you know, the archivist and the fishermen, and then the next month we went uh, to Moscow. And by then I was pretty well prepped, but I knew that Peter could take me on this, this journey and um, kind of spell it out in, in uh, sound clips at that point. And, and, and you, we were saying before that um, most of uh, contemporary Russian, you know, like the younger generation have no, uh, no, no, no understanding or no particular interest in, in, in this this bulk of, of Soviet cinema or is this not? Is well, yeah, I mean, uh, for instance, when I was at the garage, there was um, the, the younger curators there um, were, they would ask me, um, well, what are you going to do at Goss Filmifon? I said, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to research uh, Mikhail Zharov and, you know, they'd be like, who? And uh, wow. so, um, and they'd start, and then I'd start to explain and they'd start to wander and, you know, <laughs> Um, so, but you know, there's of course um, different <laughs> different people of every generation. So there was also the FedEx guy who had a Russian accent who came to my door, and I said, "Well, so do you know who Mikhail Zharov is?" Of course, <laughs> she is our great actor, Mikhail Zharov. You know, he named off a bunch, and and there was also the gal who worked in our community garden, uh, and she uh, she knew who, who he was, but she said, "But I'm like an old person. I'm I'm in a, an old person and a young person." So. Um, uh, you know, it depends on, but I would say as a whole, um, a crusty old s Soviet actor is, you know, sort of gone by the wayside is, um, you know, we have TCM that's kind of keeping our old actors alive for new generations, you know, but not everyone has that kind of access. And, and, and the film is still shown once a year? In, in, in I don't time? know if that's true, but that's <laughs> anecdotally what I've been told that is sort of, yeah, or, yeah. Well, you think about the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you know, it's, there's, I'm very grateful to that film because the type of cinema that a film like this will show in has kind of been sustained by the Rocky Horror Picture Show. There's the one in Milan, right, Julia? Yes. Right? Yeah. And there's one in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like a, a church, like how a church will come in and save a theater, you know, a big cinema for a, a decade or two. Rocky Horror Picture Show did incredible uh, work preserving, keeping yeah. an audience coming. You the know. one on 8th Street, for yeah. sure, in New York. Do you New remember York, that yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a couple of places, yeah. 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 Well, I didn't think we were going to go there, but anyway. <laughs> 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 Shout out to Rocky Horror Picture Show, you know. <laughs> a winding conversation. Okay, uh, I think we are uh, thanking Bill here profusely Thank for you. having Thank you, rushed out here. And, uh, you know. Such a pleasure, and congratulations on having your theater back. Finally, yeah. yeah. And also for this wonderful program. Oh, thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't here, but... <laughs>